This is your host, Abdul Bharatiya, and welcome to another episode of TFR. Let's talk. And today we have with us once again, Michael Cade, Global Field CTO of Cast and by Beam. Michael, it's great to have you back on the show. Uh, happy to be here. And today we are going to talk about uh, AI workloads in Kubernetes and their impact, especially in uh, 2023. Before we go uh, deeper into this uh, topic, talk a bit about where do you see uh, Kubernetes in terms of maturity and running in production? That's an ever-growing scale. Every time I've been on there, I think we've been we've been talking about those percentages and the, the gains that we're seeing, uh, at least from a especially from a customer basis where obviously we're focused on data protection and data management within Kubernetes, we're seeing a, a nice increase in, in the footprint of customers that are moving or adopting Kubernetes as a as a platform. Now let's talk about um, AI-based workloads uh, running on Kubernetes or in other way, because when we look at AI ML, it it works both. It can all also be seen as a workload, and it can also be seen as something that can actually improve uh, a lot of technologies. So, so talk about uh, it, how do you look at from what perspective? Fundamentally, AI, ML, whatever, or or deep learning as well. Like they all stem from data and data access. Now, we're obviously going to be focused on Kubernetes and, and what our talk track is there, but this isn't new from like previous platforms such as VMware or virtualization as well, right? Um, so where we start, we start talking about the data, we start talk, talking about the importance of that data. Without data, you don't have an AI or you don't have a, or you might have an algorithm, but you don't have a data set to run that algorithm against. How important is that data? Where do we get that data from? And I think that's where, that's where I tend to start, especially when we're talking to customers that are leveraging AI and they're building their own AI and ML um, operations or applications, then we start talking about the data, the importance of that data. And not always, if you think about like a, a traditional environment where maybe you'll have a, a database or a data service, maybe you'll have a some observability metrics and as, it's not as fun as maybe chat GBT or uh, gaining insight into, into data that way, but observability has a, a ream of different uh, like inf informative data points. So you might be looking at, okay, how could I leverage that data? How could I get something from that? And AI is sat on top, gives us that insight into that data. So instead of doing that from the production set, I want to take a clone of that data and I want to spin that up in the most econi like, uh, e uh, like efficient way so that I can then run run my algorithm against it or just basically get insight out of that data without affecting anything in production. So I think that's that's kind of where I'd first start that process of data is important and data is the fundamental part of AI and ML ops. If you look at Kubernetes, once again, uh, the use cases are beyond what the, the creators thought of. You know, it's it's just, you know, exploding folks are using it in so many different uh, ways. Like initially it was stateless, then it stateful, or you're saving data there. Uh, which is also kind of, though the Kubernetes community, they have, you know, they're maintaining it the way they want it. But these new use cases, they do affect project, you know, a lot of, you know, other sub projects, adjacent projects also come up. Talk a bit about how is AI ML uh, based workload affecting the Kubernetes itself, if it is. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing is, is that me, for one, the personas that I'm speaking to aren't just data protection specialists. They're not just backup teams. They're not just virtualization admins or sysadmins. I'm now having conversations with data scientists. How could we leverage that data? How could we move that data around? And then obviously, if I'm having them conversations, that, and I'm right at the bottom of the stack. I'm generally the the last port of call when it comes to data protection. I'm like the least exciting thing on the on on the docket when it comes to spend spending on a on a, a new IT project. But if it's getting to me, then then people are like data scientists are also intrigued about Kubernetes, which is only going to grow that community up into the use cases that are available to it. The challenges that that's going to bring is well. If one sysadmin wants this and a data scientist wants this, how do we make sure that we've got enough cycles or or maintainers to make sure that all of these projects have the capabilities involved? 
Um, just going back to QCon Detroit, um, the big the big takeaway there was that we don't have enough maintainers or we don't at least look after our maintainers enough now. And we have this flourishing uh, community of growing into different uh, areas and industries. We have the AI ML ops around data scientists, but then you've got to think about like edge and IOT. Uh, you've got to think about the traditional uh, virtualization admins, then the cloud engineers, the DevOps engineers, SREs, platform engineer. It becomes a huge group or a huge community that are pushing for potentially different things or similar things but there's some differentiators in in each of those things that they're they're pushing as well so i think i think the constraint is we don't have enough maintainers we don't have enough people to create and make what we need to to push all industries forward um but hopefully with what the KubeCon and the, the Linux Foundation are doing is that that's going to encourage more people to contribute and to maintain projects. And I mean, the, the CNCF landscape isn't getting smaller. I think I don't know the last time when you looked at, at that CNCF landscape, but yeah, there, there's still a, a large amount of different projects on there that are, are constantly evolving to suit to suit the needs of all all members of the community. So first of all, you know, there is already, you know, kind of, you know, uh, uh, shortage of, you know, when we look at data scientists and then if you look at uh, expertise in these Kubernetes and all those skill set, that's also not a skill set you can find easily. So talk a bit about what does this economic social change that is happening will have on teams and um, we can also talk about, you know, what VM Keston is kind of doing or the whole cloud native ecosystem is doing to help companies so that they can continue to move forward. Yeah, I think I think the skills shortage, obviously, we've spoken over the last couple of years about the skill shortage around Kubernetes and cloud native uh, as a cloud native ecosystem is, is apparent. I think what the if we look at the world and the economics that's that's going on here is is very much. Um, dictating that we have to do more with less, which is always the case, right? When we're all when when interest rates rise and we have to do more with less, and teams get shrunk, and we have to do the same amount, and and that's just that's the way this this world seems to seems to run. And I've been saying about that. I actually did a session at the beginning of the week around the, how the sysadmin is evolving, that systems administrator that maybe just looked after. A student, probably shouldn't say just, looked after a server farm within a data center and then progressively had to look after Exchange, SQL, had to look after virtualization when that came along, had to have that learning curve, um, then had to start looking at cloud. Now, there's a lot of different platforms that were just mentioned there. The sysadmin that I remember, I was a sysadmin back in the day and I looked after a a rack of, of servers I had never had the concept of virtualization. I never had the concept of cloud per se. Um, and I had to look after them. And then you have to evolve as that, that sysadmin then becomes a, a, a virtualization consultant and so on and so forth. And I think that big next evolution is around automation. How do we, how do we simplify that automation? How do we encourage people to use infrastructure as code and it's very difficult because with virtualization you could instantly see that that um that abstraction away like oh i can take that one physical 2u server or 3u server and now i can fit 10 20 30 virtual machines within that you can see that level of uh like abstraction there and with the cloud you could see that you were sending workloads up and you were taking away a you were abstracting a layer of manageability of that that workload whether it be virtual machines or databases as a service you're abstracting a level of I don't have to worry about the operating system anymore. I don't have to worry about the the server in the rack and the power to that. I pay someone else to do that. Now with automate automation, there's no real managed or abstraction layer around other than your own time. As soon as you see, for example, like using Terraform from an infrastructure's code point of view, and you create 10 virtual machines from just saying Terraform apply, that shows that the abstraction there is your time we're abstracting away that time now i understand there's forces of nature that stop us being proponents of change but 
by being a proponent of change and looking at infrastructure as code or configuration management around Ansible, around Chef, around Kubernetes, it provides us the ability to claw back some of that time because we're being asked to do so much more. And whilst doing that, you're ticking the box of being so much more valuable as a person within the IT industry or in the tech industry to be able to offer so much more out there as well. So there's a massive challenge. There's the, there's that I've, I've been a, I, I put all my time and effort into being a virtualization admin. Um, I don't want to change again. This is never going to last. This is never going to happen. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of pushback. People my age don't want to retrain and learn new new traits. And I get that. But it is. It's it's overwhelming. It's sometimes daunting. It looks like you're just looking at Everest. And I've used that terminology a few times around. Everest looks like a well. I shouldn't say that. I've never climbed Everest for the record. But Everest from base camp and even even from the airport looks an incredible size. And listening and speaking a lot to authors that have traversed um, Everest, they actually say as you get to base camp and then you start going up, it becomes more manageable, especially those people that have been able to, to do it. And I think you have to set that, that path to that learning journey as well. If you look at AIML, talk a bit about, you know, uh, what are the trends that you're seeing where you feel that, hey, you what, these are the, some of the opportunities that we missed. And uh, but now you see some positive trends when you will see that uh, we will be leveraging AI ML in a way that we should have. So if we look at like technology over the last at least 20 years that I've been in tech, it's always been driven by or mostly by that commercial sector, as in a consumer. I'm a consumer of technology at home. I have my I have my PlayStation 5. I have my Nintendo Switch. I consume technology. I have all my home automation stuff running here. And then we see that drip into the enterprise or vice versa, but mostly it comes from the other way. And I think the 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 characteristic around like chat GPT, that, that's not blown up because of, like a couple of us in the IT industry looking at it and seeing what it can do, looking at a massive data set from 2021 and seeing it all over my YouTube or all over my like blogs and, and, and feeds that I'm watching. But it's actually people that I see like down the pub and like people that are carpenters that I speak to on a daily basis, friends, they're consuming that technology. And that's the, that's the, uh, the, the, catapult for me is that as soon as you see people outside of the IT industry adopting technology, we start to, we will absolutely be double downing on that from a technology industry point of view. I think ChatGPT just shows the power of what that AI does. It also enables that automation level. Like I, I don't know how much you've done with, with ChatGPT, but you can quite easily make it it can it can write pretty good code samples if you ask it the right questions. You can write a program with it, so that opens up the door to again squashing that that barrier to entry, that that learning curve that that I've mentioned before. I think also um, other big vendors bringing out their VR and their ability to 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 jump into an immersive world only opens up the door to bigger tech firms doing more of that things that stuff as well um i think that is actually the i think we might talk about it like we've been talking about ai and ml for for a while about gleaning data leveraging data and especially from backup um backup data we've been saying about doing this for for at least five years i have at least but until something like a, a company like apple or microsoft or place or sony bring out a the capability of being able to do it in your own home, that's what then leapfrogs us back into a, oh, we'll start looking at leveraging data, getting some sort of insight out of that data to provide better business outcomes or just like, let's break it down to mitigating risk or reducing cost. Like any of them three things is a top, top thing for a business, especially in the, the day and age where we are, where we're trying to reduce costs. We have to do something with nothing. We have to mitigate risks still because those threats around cybersecurity are not going away. How can we be sharper to the, the point around that? And anything that can offer better business outcomes from that data that allows us to understand a little bit more about selling, selling um, trends and 
how people use our application, where they use it. Like they allow us to enhance that application, which means that we're only going to make more revenue in these tough times where people aren't necessarily, people are like bracing for a, for a huge economic downturn. Talk a bit about uh, the challenges that are there when it comes to, as you rightly said, it's all about data. Uh, challenges that are there and how Cast and Beam are helping you know users to kind of protect some of the data because that is also important. There's two 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 answers to that, and one is around just being able to protect data, just normal data services, databases that are living within or outside of the Kubernetes cluster, as well as the whole. Veeam data platform, looking after all sorts of data protection. The second is obviously we focus on backup and recovery of that data, but in doing so, we also lend quite nicely to being able to clone a copy of that data from the backup versus having to use your production. So if you are looking for that data set or potential several data services and you want to put that into one uh one application to understand a little bit more about that workload and what it looks like, then we've got the ability to lend that to it. So like I mentioned around, I'm speaking to a lot more data scientists, they're actually using that sort of clone technology to be able to push their algorithm against that and then glean information from that. So again, we're just focused on the data and backing up that data from an insurance policy point of view. But there's a, such an extension and extensibility to what we're doing that it opens up the door to different areas and different people that have similar but different um, requirements when it comes to that that data management. How much awareness do you see is there when it comes to AI ML workloads uh, uh, and data production, data recovery, disaster recovery, high availability? So I would say since our last, so we have a we we do have a case study out there specifically around data scientists using. Casting K10, um, I would say that 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 conversation has very much started even more so over the last nine months. I know that the KubeCon in Detroit was very themed around AI ML ops, if if you will, as well as data as well. If we look at the release release cadence of Kubernetes, that three a year, each one of those, at least for the last two, maybe two and a half years, has been focused around data and and data at scale as well. Obviously, there's a lot of um, scalability within Kubernetes as a platform compared to something like virtualization. Um, so yeah, I think again, it's it's a growing number that we're seeing around adopting. And I think from a data scientist point of view, they they don't know what they don't know, and them trying to take models and and uh, algorithms from maybe an existing area that they used to work in and trying to bring that into Kubernetes. It's just that maybe a little bit different, but also being able to get a hold of that data in a fast, efficient way is is another key area to, to consider. Michael, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic today. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me.